Next speaker is Joao Ramos, and he's going to talk about whole body teleoperation of humanoid robots via bilateral feedback for dynamic physical interactions. All right, let me see if I can share my screen. All right, can you, can you guys see this? Yes. All right, so uh, thanks again for, for the invitation. It's great to be here talking with very inspiring speakers. Uh, it's hard to talk uh, right after Professor Rohogan, and Professor Ferris, but I'll give my best. So let's see. So my name is João Ramos. I'm an assistant professor at Mechanical Science Engineering, University of Illinois. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of my work on humanoid teleoperation and uh, bilateral feedback. So the whole motivation for my work began with the Fukushima Daiichi power plant nuclear disaster. And at the time, they, what they wanted to do is actually be able to send robots to try to address the situation. So what everybody had in mind at the time was that robots would be able to go in there, use tools, and do all these things, um, very complex tasks on the fly. And to my understanding, what I think we wanted was robots that you know, would be able to really replace the human in a very dangerous situation. So be able to you know, be firefighters or policemen and things like that. And if you look at all these uh, challenges, the, the common thing that they have is physical interaction. It's, and it's a very non-trivial physical interaction, right? And I think that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there for autonomous robots or teleoperating ones. And I think a very, a very interesting, more recent example of this is, for example, the pandemic we're right now in. So this is a report from uh, Professor uh, Robin Murphy from Texas A&M. And she's trying to quantify the use of teleoperator robots in the fight of pandemics. So here you can see on all the countries and where they're being used at. And if, if you look at them, they have been very useful in all the tasks that involve some sort of, you know, disinfecting some area or telepresence or uh, making some sort of delivery. But you can see that it's a common thing that in none of these applications, there is meaningful physical interaction, which means that robots are not being used anywhere when it needs to interact either with patients or tools, right? And I can see why. So let's, and I think that what we wanted is to have robots physically interacting with people to do tasks such as taking care of patients, right? And if you look at, for example, helping a patient take out a bed, it's an incredibly difficult task. Right, it's a whole body manipulation task. It's contact reach, it involves balancing regulation, it involves locomotion, it gives views of a bunch of sensory inputs, visual perception, and it requires a domain expertise of a nurse that knows what uh, he or she is doing, right? So I, I think it's, it's a very complicated task. So sort of, um, so my, my research is exactly about this, is if, if I have a, a human teleoperating a robot to, you know, interact with the environment. What I'm trying to understand is what do I, what kind of physical feedback, what kind of feedback do I give to the person in a whole body level that helps the person to better perform this task, right? So if the robot needs to push a very heavy object, how do I tell the person, you know, the robot needs to lean more his body to make this, this object move, right? So what boils down to my research question is, so I, my hypothesis is if we map Human body, uh, human body motion to robot at the whole body level. Um, and the important thing is that if you give the human sufficient, I don't, I don't want to say like complete, I just want to say sufficient, whole body feedback to the operator to complete the task, I think that we can get to the point that a human can use uh, their own motor intelligence or learn how to develop motor primitives that control the whole body, you uh, know, the, the, that controls the robot in a whole body level to complete the test, right? Um, so this is gonna be the outline of my talk, uh, is a duplication of what I just tried to motivate to a bunch of different systems. So let's uh, get right into that. Let's see. Okay, I'm doing that time. Okay. Um, so first I'm talk a little bit about the Hermi system, which is a very, was a prototype that we put together at the time when honestly we didn't have a very good idea what we were doing. Um, but we gave her our best shot, given our knowledge from the robotic side of controls, right? So this came out at I3 Spectrum a while ago. And at the time, the, the, the mapping that we did was very simple. So we're Cartesian mapping. The, the amount of the, the motion that the person does with their hands is going to be linearly mapped to the, what the robot's going to reproduce. And this is sort of the, 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 
the performance that you get, right? And then it looks very, very complicated, very fancy because the robot's a humanoid, but actually the control is very, very simple. And I think that's something that is nice that you right off the bat get for free is that when you're doing teleoperation, um, because you have a person there, you get the dexterous manipulation very fast. When no, there's no uh, force feedback here. Uh, and also you get human level perception. So for example, the robot perceiving this fire that would completely mess up any sort of uh, visual, visual information for autonomous system. Now you get it for free and you get this really, hard, really nice performance, right? But at the time we're trying to understand what can we do in a whole body level, right? So uh, Hermes was actually built to test more dynamic, more dynamic features. So for example, some of the things that we played with is, you know, how can you get the robot to physically interact with the environment in a harsh way, so punch through the wall, or use, for example, here, this ax to strike a wall. So what we're trying to understand is how, what are the best ways that the human can come up with strategies in a whole body level that would allow the robot to do something like this. And we got some really interesting results that you can see here. It was visually motivating, but there's not the complete story, right? So just to give an idea, at the time we were looking to this model-free uh, balance, balance feedback, right? So we would look at it, is the image that you see on the left. You would get the COP of the robot. We measured the, different, the distance between the COP and the edge of the support. And then we would apply a force to the operator that is proportional, inversely proportional to that distance. So the, the closest the COP of the robot was to the edge, so closer you was from falling, the harder you push the, the operator in a different direction. So you can get this interesting adaptation to, for example, if the robot's trying to lift up a payload, the human would be able to adapt and adjust the posture. But uh, as I said, this is a, was a model free, right? So it was is a interesting result, but there's a lot more to the to how to actually complete this very dynamic task that we are not getting into. So I think we learned a lot of really interesting things. For example, we learned how to how to get rid of all the things that are not necessary for the teleoperation that we want, so we can enable very fast teleoperation. Um, we try to develop robots that are able to, you know, generate and absorb large forces. Um, and you're looking to this: how do you create a human-machine interaction that has large feedback forces? But one of the issues that we notice is that you know, if you want to really want to be able to do something like this, you really need to take into account the dynamics of the system. So the feedback from the robot to the person must have some sort of um, information about the dynamics of the system, some sort of stability metric or something like this, right? So if you want to apply large forces and you're a biped machine or, or human, you need to be able to regulate balance, right? And how do you boil down information about balance? So this is, after the results that we had on Hermes, this is sort of the, the, the uh, Answer I was trying to, I was I started pursuing afterwards. So that comes to the second system that I want to talk about, um, which is the card pole system. So for that, we develop a human machine interface that we call the balance feedback interface. And this is what it looks like. Um, pretty much it boils down to a vest that is attached to this sort of uh, two push and pull rods so they can apply forces to the operator. Um, so this is, this is what they look like. They can apply a uh, force, so in this case, on the frontal plane. Um, we track the position of the feet using this passive um, 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 linkage systems. And the reason why we use a physical system is because if you're using coders, you can get a very high sampling rate on the order of 10 kilohertz in comparison to any sort of vision system. Uh, there's a real-time computer, and the person would uh, stand on top of this force plate so we can get an idea of what are the interaction forces with the ground. And something that was, it's um, very interesting for um, uh, human locomotion is that some of the motions that we perform, especially the, the, the cyclic ones, they can boil down to a very, a very uh, special information, which is kind of the core components of that motion, right? So for example, the, the image that you see here on this animation is exactly is what I capture from the motion that you see on the left side. So I would take the, the point that you see on the, on the, on the rectangle is a central mass. You get the position of the two feet. And also you get the position of a central pressure. And that, that arrow that you see is a net force that a person is applying to the ground as you move around. So this is what I would, I would call the core components of locomotion when you're stepping around. 
So there's a very interesting model for this that possibly most of you know it already. It's called an inversion, the linear inverted pendulum. So if you isolate the position of a central mass and the position of a central pressure, um, you get this motion that you see in this animation. And what is nice about it is that it is a very simple linear model that's called the linear inverted pendulum. And that system de describes very powerfully in a very simple way what the person is trying to do, despite the fact that we are a very complicated system, right? And for those of you who have more of a controls inclination, this system looks a lot like the cart pole, right? So if you think about um, the position of the cart is equivalent to the position of the central pressure, and the position of the mass is equivalent to the position of the central mass of the, of the person, um, then the system has a very similar dynamics to what I show here on the right side, which is the cart board, right? So if I, you know, push you, which is tapping on the central mass, you shift your central pressure to the other direction in order to catch yourself, right? So <clears throat> this similarity in dynamics demonstrated that, you know, if you can boil down human information to something that is behaves simply as a pendulum like this, then you can control a system that is, has very simple, similar dynamics. Right, so let me give an example of that is. So the core thing about the deliberation strategy is that instead of trying to map to the robot the entire human motion, what I'm going to try to map is a condensed version of a human motion, right? So we capture human motion, we reduce that to a simple model. So that could be the linear rate of pendulum. We take that model and then we scale that core information to the robot. So it performed you know, dynamic scaling forces and positions. And then we use that motion with the, in a, a local robot controller in order to make the robot move. And that controller could be any kind of control that you like, MPC, LQR, QP, whatever. Um, so in order to give the human the feedback of what is happening, then we use the simple model. So we, we take the error between the two simple models, and then maybe you can add some external disturbance to the robot, and then we perform kinematic mapping to give that information back to the human, right? So I know there's been a lot of information, so let me give an example to try to break this down. So let's not look at the external disturbance right now. So the first thing that we have is the human, right? The human motion. So we capture that motion and then we condense it out to the linear inverted pendulum model, which is the video that I just displayed to you. We take that information and then we scale to the robot. Maybe the robot's much smaller, maybe the robot's much larger. We scale that information to the robot, to the robot dynamics size, right? So the robot reduced model is also a linear inverted pendulum. And then we use that reduced model to control the full robot. And in this case, I'm just gonna show you for the carpool, so the system is just a carpool. Um, so here, the, the kinodynamic scaling that you do is that you map the relative position of the central mass and the central pressure. Uh, that provides a reference to the robot. And what we want to do is to make sure that this, the reduced models of the two systems are kinematically, uh, are dynamically similar. So that means that if the human can be described as a simple model, and that simple model is stable. If the robot has an equivalent model and that model is also stable, then the two can work together, right? So this is the basic idea. And just to show, just to um, exemplify the controller that I use here is just a simple OQR. So this is the information that you get, right? So this is the teleoperation that you get. So here, there's no visual information. There's no uh, audio information. The person is just trying to teleoperate this cart pole using dynamics. And what I want you to pay attention to is that, you know, the central mass and the central pressure of the two systems, they match, despite the fact that uh, this pendulum is about half the human size. You cannot see too well because of the perspective, but this, this pendulum is about uh, half a meter and human central mass here is about a meter high. Um, so the point that I want to make is that the person is performing, is generating these dynamic trajectories for the robot in real time, despite the fact that they have different natural frequencies, right? So they are, what they happen is that they become dynamically synchronized. And the reason that this happens is because the feedback between the, the force feedback applied to the person makes sure that the two are dynamically synchronized all the time, right? Um, okay, so the point that I wanna make is that if you, if, you want, if you look at the central pressure and the central mass and you normalize by the height of the two, then the, the two, track each other. And the, the moment and the, the force that is being generated by the force feedback is what you see here in red. So it can get up, up to 50 Newton meters. So pretty much what happens is that if the robot is trying to move faster, is falling faster, the, 
the human machine interface push you to move faster. If the robot is sort of lagging behind, the force feedback creates drag, so it holds your motion back. So what happens is that in the end, the two become synchronized. So the human becomes sort of like a motion planner for the robot to move. Okay? So I hope it was a little bit uh, clear what I was trying to do here. The last system that I want to talk about is implementation of actual an actual bipedal robot, right? The, the card pole is a visual um, demonstration of what that means for the simple, simple model, but what we actually want to do is apply that to a bipedal system. So in order to do that, I, I, we built this robot. It's called Little Hermes. Uh, there's a bunch of details to it, including these actuators that we developed for being very dynamic. So we wanted to be able to you know, perform this, uh, uh, very fast motions. And that goes into um, very lightweight limbs, uh, foot sensor that we use for, to detect force, um, IMU, real-time computer, battery, a frame. And for all the demonstrations I'm going to make here, the robot was just constrained to the frontal plane. So it cannot fall forward and it cannot fall back, right? And to make things more interesting, the robot was very small. So the robot is about one-third of human scale. So that means that if you look, if you think just about the physics, the robot is going to want to move faster. So the natural frequency of stepping around is faster. So in order to, we apply the same methodology, right? So what we do is actually condense human information to a simple model, scale that to the robot. And this is what it looks like. The, this animation is the video of the person moving around. So this is the information that I capture. So you can get, you know, position of the, feet, the foot, position of the, the central pressure, that arrow is the force that, I, that I'm generating against the ground and position of central mass. We condense that information to the, the linear inverted pendulum. So see, here you see the linear inverted pendulum moving around. And what we do is that instead of scaling the whole human body motion to the robot, we scale just this reduced model. So when the reduced model of the robot moves around, this is what it looks like. And then the robot has its own feedback controller that connects the reduced model to the full body model. So from the reduced model that you see on the, the second to last figure, the robot figures out what are the ground direction forces that should be applying on the ground in order to reproduce the motion of that reduced model, right? And in this case, so what, the point that I wanna make sure is that the two reduced models are dynamically similar, right? So it's just an idea of trying to con condense the whole information to make the, the core components of the locomotion of the dynamics I'm trying to do perform similar, right? So for the robot to um, be able to follow the human locomotion, you would use this sort of primitive controllers. So from a given position of central mass, you just figure out what are the forces should be generated on the ground. And it would also be able to uh, put its feet around autonomously, right? So that in order to follow what the person is doing. So in both these situations, the robot is just trying to stand. There's no person operating anything. I just want to make sure that you understand that this is the controller that maps the reduced model to the full body model, right? So if, and the last point that I want to make is that uh, we need to make sure that the two uh, are dynamically synchronized. So for in this case, uh, there's a feedback force that if the robot moves in respect to what the human is trying to do, there's a feedback force that's applied to the person to make sure that the, the two are synchronized. So if you look at the equation, it just boil down to this sort of damping effect. So if there's a velocity difference between the two, there's a force that's generating, this generated that's applied to that person. And it, you, the, what you get is this very nice synchronized motion. And I think that the powerful thing about these results is that these motions are not predefined. They're not pre-computed. They are motions that are being generated on the fly by the operator. And then if you look, for example, at the, the, second, the second plot here, the, the COP of the two, the robot and the human go to single stance together. So that means that they're taking steps simultaneously. So what I want to get to at some point is the, fact, is the point that the person can, on the fly, tell the robot what to step, right? So um, let me just move a little bit faster here. So the other thing that you get is um, very... Um, so you, because there's a person there, there's a lot of other tests that you can do on the fly as long as your model allows you to do that. So for example, uh, you know, this little jumps here, or if there is an obstacle that is not present for the person, you can just change the mapping between the reduced model and the full body model and make the robot account for that, right? So 
What is interesting is the fact that the two are still synchronized despite the fact that there's some difference in dynamics between the two, right? Okay, so I just wanna give a quick hint on some of the directions that I'm gonna follow after this. So I think that the, 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 the core idea is that I wanna measure, I wanna um, merge all this manipulation things that I did with Hermes or all the locomotion, what I did with little Hermes and really focus on what I call this dynamic mobile manipulation task. So these are very highly dynamic motions. They follow, uh, they, they perform in this whole body coordination, they regulate balance and, and things like that. So I really think that if you provide the person with the correct feedback and map the whole body movements, and then you can get to the point where you can do this. And again, so if you're gonna use the same framework that I did in the past, now maybe what we need to do is make sure the reduced model can, can capture the dynamics of what you're trying to do, right? So for example, uh, if your reduced model now has some inertia to it, has some compliance to it, so how can you match the two systems in a way that the reduced model captures the dynamics that you're trying to perform, right? Okay, so with that, I just want to thank some of the people that helped me with this research in many different ways and some of the sponsors, and I guess I'll take any questions if there are any. Thanks, Joao. Thanks for your presentation. We have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, um, is that one. Is the virtual reality with 3D or augmented reality is a part in your research for immersion of the operator in decent situation? Um, so uh, at the moment, no. So yes and no. Yes, because a lot of what I do is I always test the uh, the controllers on simulated robots before I put it on, on, on the real robot, just because I get rid of half of the problems first. Um, but I haven't been looking too much into actually using virtual reality. But the nice thing about it is that in that case, you don't have a lot of the issues that you normally have in robots, which is the delays and compliance and, and, and all the, the nonlinear stuff that we don't know how to measure. Um, but I definitely think that um, the, the interface that I'm trying to develop is directly applicable to both immersive virtual reality and also biomechanics, right? I think what is really nice about um, this uh, human machine interface is that it's a very, it's a very nice system to perturb the person and also uh, read all everything that you need to, to measure. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered that, but yeah. And concerning the delay, the other question is how to deal with this delay during the whole body teleoperation and guarantee the stability of the robot body? Yeah, so this is a question that I get a lot. And um, I, in everything that I showed, the robot was wired to the person. So there, I was trying to get the best, best possible, get rid of all the delays. Um, but what I, what I think is important to note is that humans are very, a naturally very, very slow system, right? So if you look at the natural frequency of our pendulum, that's something on, is less than 10 hertz. So I, I, here, I, all the force feedback information that I was using was something on the order of, uh, was about one kilohertz, but I think you can probably reduce that to a 10 and still get away with it uh, um, pretty well. So one thing that is very, what ended up happening that I think is very interesting is that a lot of this, um, a lot of this controller happens as a feed forward from person to robot, and the feedback is just locally on the robot. So it's a lot more robust to stability than a, a system that would have the feedback throughout the entire control, the human loop um, um, strategy, right? So I don't know, but I'm, I'm assuming that you can probably get away with a lot more feedback than system that has the, the try to do with very fine force feedback in small, small scale. Okay, thank you.